Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, welcome to another edition of uh, Word in Your Attic. And we are delighted to be uh, thrilled to be in the Zoom with uh, the prolific author and uh, wonderful writer, an old pal of ours from the days of Word magazine, the great Nigel Tassel. Nigel, welcome. Hello. Good uh, morning. Um, oh, morning. Where do we find you? Where, where are you? I'm in the kitchen. You'll always find me in the kitchen at lockdown. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just the littlest hobo in the house because with the kids being home and homeschooled, I just, wherever I can perch my laptop, uh, as Paul Young once said, that's my home. Um, and so the kitchen is, is, is where I work from, which is, which is dangerous because to my left is the biscuit cupboard. And to my right, they say, they say the pram yeah, in the, the hall. the sherry. <laughs> the, they say the pram in the hall is the greatest distraction to work. I say it's the six by three snooker table in the conservatory Ooh, because that uh, is my downfall and that is why I end up not being as productive as I might. Because you, so you, you used to have an office in a kind of, you used to go to a stately home, didn't you? Well, remember, uh, yeah, I used to, if, if we were recording this seven, eight years ago, I would be, I would have all my CDs and my books behind me and I looked like I was a complete, uh, complete culture vulture. Um, but you know, straightened times meant I couldn't, right. couldn't afford the garret anymore. So yes, right. I'm, I'm I'm here at home wherever I can find find space for the laptop. Right. And have you had time to you know dig through the uh, the uh, the possessions and, and dust down a few old records and things? I have a disclaimer first though, because you've had my friend James Hyman on here. You know the man who's in the Guinness book Guinness Book of World Records for the biggest magazine collection. You know the ultimate order. I am the polar opposite. I mean, there are, I don't think any pictures of me in existence from in my teenage years. I, I don't collect. I'm just not that I'm efficient and declutter well. I just never held on to things. However, I have done the decent thing and I've, I've found enough to get us through today. Um, I'm going to start with a book. Um, I grew up, where I grew up in a little village, I was really fortunate there was a library at the end of my street. Um, and I don't know whether that had an effect on being a writer. And I was a football mad kid at the time, seven, eight, nine. And the one football book in there served me really well. And Dave will like this for obvious reasons. If I hold up, there we are. Hunter Davis. Oh, glad. The great oh, Hunter yes. Davis. Hunter Davis scores a word in your ear guest in the past. We've had him. Oh, uh, we've had great him man. A great him. man. Um, I've got several editions of this book. A bit fell off just then. There we go. Um, this isn't, it would be really nice if I said this is the copy that I liberated from the library. Um, it's not, it's the same edition. We've got Martin Peters there and a player who I'd never known who it is, but uh, you can just see his buttocks in there. Um, <laughs> if you can identify of 1970s. Can you identify him by his buttocks? Maybe you can. <laughs> not Martin Chibbers or, or Alan Gilzine or even Ralph Coates. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know the book, this is Hunter um, spending a season embedded with Tottenham during the 71-72 uh, season um, and properly embedded. He'd do the training with them and it was just for a young kid who read Shoot Magazine, Roy the Rovers, Match Weekly and, and soaked up all the stats or read match reports in the papers. This introduced him to what journalism was, what proper writing was about football and how deep you could go and, and talk about the players' lives. And I've always found Football clubs are a really fascinating place. Even now, I still I love going to football clubs in the six and a half days of the week when there's no match going on. I find them really fascinating places and how the week there revolves around this 90 minutes and the build-up yeah. to it and yeah. the aftermath. I found them absolutely fascinating places. This book, though, I had on permanent loan from the library for <laughs> three or four years. No one got lucky <laughs> in my in my book. Um, and it's uh, a wonderful would, every, word, that... every three weeks, I would religiously walk down there to get it renewed. And this is pre-digital days, very analog. So <laughs> I'd have this nervous 90-second walk to the end of my street to, uh, oh, God, I hope no one's reserved there. I really hope. And then you get there, and the librarian ticks through, she has this big table of cards, and having to pull, just search through them alphabetically, pull it out, 
no one had. And I'd walk home going, I got it for another three weeks. <laughs> I had it out all the time. No one knew it actually existed, but um, a great book. And Hunter's been it's a, it's a, a bit of an inspiration book. because he, he you know, writes about so many subjects uh, and, and he's very prolific and, and a measure that you can write really well with quality, but you don't need to spend four or five years writing a book, you know. And he still, he still yeah. writes about football for the New Statesman. I and mean, he's still, still, still at it. Now, you know, and he's, he's yeah. a great man. I sent him a copy of uh, one of my books, actually. And uh, he sent me an email back, email back um, praising me for my handwriting, which the <laughs> eight-year-old Nigel Tassel would have absolutely loved. Um, <laughs> now, now that you, but you no mention read, of the book. <laughs> <laughs> you've, read, you've read a lot of football books. Am I right in thinking the glory game is genuinely unique because it's, it's, you know, uninterrupted behind the scenes access to a top level football club. Never happened again, I don't think, did it? Never happened again. It used to happen, um, George, I'm forgetting his surname now, the American writer, uh, George Clinton, um, who, who embedded himself with several American clubs. Yeah, but, no, but not, not in English football. But not in English. He, he was absolute groundbreaker. And it, for my it's last extraordinary. Book, and for my last book, it was on the transfer window and me trying to embed myself with a Premier League or Championship club just on deadline day, just on one day, not a whole season. I mean, I spent three transfer windows trying to pull that off and I yeah. eventually managed it with dear old Burnley allowed me in um, on transfer deadline day of the January before last. And so I'm driving up there, really excited. I had, I had one-on-one time with Sean Dyche, the manager, even on, on transfer deadline days, so I felt gratified. And I was driving up the M5 and I got to um, services that are close to Gloucester, Worcester border. And uh, I had talk sport on there and they said, we've got hot news. We, hot news on transfer deadline day rarely means hot news, but you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're keeping the balloon in the air there. Hot news from Turf Moor. Brilliant. I'm off on my way to Turf Moor, Burnley. Peter Crouch is on. I'm on the same way as Peter Crouch. So the transfer <laughs> of the day happened to go inside with the club I'd finally managed to get in with. So that was a delight. And, and, and meeting Sean Dyche, who's... Obviously, I don't think the bones of my hand have recovered from the handshake since. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Hard. This was January. There was snow on the ground in Burnley. He's in his shorts, of course. Of course he <laughs> is. Of course he is. Quite a little right, character, but really generous with his time on a time when he's, he's trying to sign players and, you know, save yeah. his team season. He, he probably just wanted somebody to sit with on the most nervous day of the year because there's nothing they can do most of the time. They just sit there, don't they? It's Wait, all in the hands of agents the phone's and ring. secretaries and directors of football, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic. No, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. It, it's great because it's still a great piece of writing, obviously, but it also is. it's a snapshot of a, a professional football just we wouldn't recognise now. And just from the jacket, I just want to read one little bit is Hunter Davis has lived an entire season with a first division football club and reveals the pains and pleasures in the dressing room, on the trainer's bench, on their trips around England and Europe, and this is the killer line, and in the privacy of their twenty thousand pound homes. <laughs> yeah. This is great. Ah, it's brilliant. It's Falling brilliant. on hard times. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what else? What, what, um, have you got any of the, uh, the records you listened to when you were a kid? Any, I any have. Of the I first have, records um, you bought or anything? First record I bought, I don't have any more. It wasn't a record, it was a cassette. It was the Electric Light Orchestra's A New World Record. It um, seems they, they all started with the Electric Light Orchestra, all these, all these sort of 80s children, didn't they? Well, I've got two, I've got two observations. From, from being deep in middle age now about the Electric Light Orchestra. When I bought it, when I was on holiday at my grand's house, she lived by the sea, and she said, are you sure you want to spend your holiday money on this? Because she saw the word orchestra in the, in the name. I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got home. She's worried. <laughs> yeah, she's worried, going, what on earth is he listening to? Um, so I put the tape in my little Sanyo radio cassette, and she was relieved that it was rock music, so that's fine, yeah. that was fine. But it's only in the last five years, one, that I've realized, I've just known them as the Electric Light Orchestra, but of course, Light Orchestra being a pun on Electric Light. I light never realised that for years either. I didn't I get that at all. And that was just revelatory to me. Well, oh sorry, God. sorry, yeah. boys. Have neither of you ever seen the cover of the first Electric Light Orchestra? Which has an electric light bulb on it. A, it right? is entirely dominated by electric light bulb. I never got it. I'm sorry. It's a pun it's that really even I got. 
It's he like I didn't even get Sandy Shaw for till very recently. I didn't <laughs> yeah, realise that, that was a joke. Well, that was her real name. But anyway, you, you have just revealed that to me because I didn't get it at all. There we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but that's one aspect. The other aspect is I bought it because I thought they did this song. Do 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 do. Bought several albums. Couldn't find that song anywhere. Turns out that's uh, fanfare for the common man. Well, hey, oh, of course. Oh, and okay. it's only, again, this is in the last 12 months that I've realised ELP, ELO. I completely had the wrong band. <laughs> so by mistake, ELO became my favourite band for three or four years without the song that I was trying to You're, find. A, you're actually that's... trying to buy ELP. ELP. Yes. You got ELP. That's oh, that's fair. brilliant. I've never heard of that Long one. diversion. That's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's embarrassing. Anyway, so yeah. uh, the first record the itself, first, error. first single, I could lie to you and say it wasn't uh, Elton John's song for Guy that I bought the local <laughs> news agents, very cheap, without the middle bit in, second hand, so I knew it was from a jukebox, never could play it because it didn't have the middle bit. So instead I'm going for this. Oh, Lift it up a bit higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, right. right. Lovely. Dance, dance. So better I could lie. This is Dexy's first single, Dance, Dance. I could lie and say at 10 years old, I was ahead of the curve. Um, but I would have bought this later, secondhand, after Gino being number one. Um, I know Pete Perfides has been talking about them a lot, writes about them a lot, very articulately, articulately very poignantly in his book. Um, but I just liked this... I wanted to be one of their horn players. I think I liked ELO because they had a lot of members in their band. And I wanted to be in a band with lots of members. And Dexys were like, and Dexys yeah, were a bit more rebellious because they would they would get on a train without a ticket and go they to were. <laughs> I can, I can remember that. that three months when, when it, in Smash Hits and the Enemy, everybody talked about the fact that Dexys could vault over the barriers at the railway station. That's right. Everybody thought, how exciting is that? You know, that was the height of scandal. This is 1980. I'm yeah. saying this is 40 years ago. We were talking about that, <laughs> that Dexys album. Only, only this week, weren't we, Mark? It's 40 we years ago. We were, this month. To a 12-year-old Smash Hits reader, uh, you know, they were considered to be the most rebellious thing imaginable, weren't they? They were, you know, and then they moved on to more rebellion. They wore dungarees. That's right. Uh, and, you know, and plimp yeah. songs and, and, and got folk instruments out, you know. They were, yeah, they were yeah, yeah, But nobody, 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 am I right in saying, ever followed them down the dungaree route, did they? Whereas their earlier incarnation... Any lad could get a donkey jacket and a kind of woolly kind of uh, yeah. commando's hat and then sit in a tea bar in station looking <laughs> kind of glowering at other people. You know, well, they, they, that they was cool about it. Sorry? They did the song about it, the teams that meet in calves, you know, is one of the songs on that. Oh, right, that's right. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's anything like, you know, reinforcing your brand by writing a song about what you, how you spend your day, you know? That's, yeah, uh, but, that's but come on, Eileen, I mean, obviously a huge, enormous hit, but nobody followed them down the kind of sartorial route yeah. that led to the, 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 the bib and brace dungaree, did they? I don't think they did at all. No. Well, okay. Did you, did you not, okay. Dave, you not, you not slip on a pair of dungarees in your time? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I think at one point in my life, there may even have been a pair of duggery. No, I think I wear some around the time Lowell George adopted them. A little <laughs> yeah, oh, you remember Lowell George, very probably. briefly. Yeah, went for... No, for, quite a while. White clogs quite a while. at the same time. Yeah. Okay. A great I, also, I also did that, the white clogs. I once went for a day out in the country wearing white clogs. That's how appallingly committed I was. Had you never been to the country <laughs> before? <laughs> you didn't know what it was like. It's <laughs> muddy, Dave, and wet. And <laughs> God, and not, not my white. feet have never hurt quite so much since. No, no. That's extraordinary. So, right, ELO. Oh. Uh, what, uh, Guy, you said uh, Guy's song. They're Elton John. Is it Guy's song? Song for Guy, yeah. Song for it's a near that. instrumental one, yeah. <coughs> it was about a lad who died in a car crash, wasn't it? Yeah. It was about so, but a, messenger, didn't have a, bit, a so messenger boy at uh, worked at Rocket Records. Ah, he was the yeah. messenger of Rocket Records, 
um, who died, as you say, died in, a, in yeah, some sort of yeah. automobile well, accident. Quite a maudlin first first tune, you know. It should be. It's not <laughs> I was going to say, I can say you, you're how old? You're how old then, <laughs> Nigel? How no, old are you? Uh, nine or ten, then. Yeah, yeah. Nine or ten. I fancy a maudlin instrumental about a recently deceased motorcycle message. What a toe tapper! <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wasn't the Wombles. No, definitely wasn't. No, no, no. What and else do you got there, Dyne? So in going through Dexy, going through my singles then, to find, find that Dexy's one, I just remembered how, then when I got into sort of late pre-teens into my teens, so 12, 13, 14, I was obsessed for some reason with the city of Liverpool and not because of football. I would, it was Brookside, it was Bleasdale, it was a Bunnyman. Bunnyman, Teardrop Explodes. Yeah, oh, I, 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 Mark Cooper did a book called Liverpool Explodes. I've I love that. And, yeah. And I became so forensically, intricately familiar with the various lineups of the Teardrop Explodes. I could tell you which tracks Mick Finkler played guitar on, which ones Alan Gill did. You know, I just got obsessed by them. My school poetry project was on the lyrics of Wilder, the difficult second album which I can never, I was 13 years old. How the hell did I know what the hell he was on about? I, I doubt I would now. And he yet, didn't know what he was on I about. I suspect, yes, I suspect a man whose second album was called Fried, he didn't have too much of a clue either. But, um, <laughs> but yes, so there's just so much Liverpool stuff in there. So we got Echo and a Bunnyman. So we got, this the is the cut cutter. and Wah, the story of the blues. Oh yeah, now which uh, Wah? Great record. Story of the blues, yes. Yeah. Although it's completely out of tune. We used to talk about that on Smashes. Didn't we? we used to join in with it in the office and point out there was a quarter tone out all the way through. <laughs> didn't stop anybody buying it. Number three, if I remember right. Yeah, well both in the top ten the same week in January 1983, yeah. along with U2's New Year's Day. At that point, brave New Year, I thought this is brilliant, the new romantics are going. And now the interesting guys with long coats, we're coming, we're, we're going to take the charts. Didn't completely happen. So lots of so we have the icicle works. Um, <laughs> obviously, the teardrop explodes. Oh right, Air, which was Ian Browdy's early band of Ian Browdy. Oh, oh right, I don't remember that. that. Flaming yeah. sword, dreadful yeah. lyrics. Who will buy my flaming sword? Wielded strong and broad. Um, pale fountains. Very good. Uh, they made right. some good. Mike Head made some great records. Yeah, Laurie and the Chameleons. Yeah, cool. now. Can we stop there a second? We can, I, thought to, we? I thought to myself, is he going to produce Touch by Laurie and the Camellias? Well, I thought, you know. um, and, he, so and he, he did, because I interviewed whoever was purporting to be Laurie, Laurie? Okay, for yeah. Smash Hits at the time. Phone interview with this woman from Liverpool. Okay. Who was she? Who was she really? I've never looked, and I don't want to. I, I quite like the mystery. I, I, Touch was their the big single. Um, <laughs> they had one called The Lonely Spy, which was really mystery, uh, mysterious and had a real Cold War sort of edge to it. So I quite like the mystery of not knowing who they were. The Chameleons, of course, were Bill Drummond and David right. Bauer, um, right. who, who then you know, went on to lots and lots of other things. Um, actually, there's a picture, so help. On the B side, look, that is Laurie. Laurie, if you're out there. There she is. Yeah, I've got a feeling. I've also been haunted by a feeling ever since that she didn't really exist. She was just somebody who was a young female who was in the office, you know, who can answer the phone. Didn't you once, Mark? I had that with Grandmaster Flash. <laughs> I did an interview with a Radio 1 exclusive, world exclusive with Grandmaster Flash. And it was a phoner. It took ages to set up. They put it on. I said, so, Grandmaster, if I can call you that, you know. <laughs> so I, I knew tons about him. I researched it vigorously. And whenever I asked him anything about his youth or the records he might have bought or the clubs he'd been to or the people he might know, he didn't seem to know anything about it. He was, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, it was an absolute non-starter. They had to whittle it down to about, I don't know, the best part of 45 seconds, having trailed it all day. And I found out later it was just a blow. The Grandmaster couldn't be asked to do it. And just got, I don't know, it was a motorcycle messenger or somebody working on the switchboard or something. <laughs> you see, I think it, this goes on all the time, you know. I'm sure that's it does. It's a good yeah. theme, a good theme of, yeah, people yeah. who, you know, we, always, we have the famous guy on BBC News, you know, the guy who was in reception, who had the name. Yes. Guy, oh, yes. Guy, you know, that, 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 it was that rushed thing. onto a live news programme, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and didn't I still, well. Taxi I, driver, still yeah. I still love the look on his face when he realised that their mistake, you know, you can yeah. see his eyebrows go up, but he keeps going. It's extraordinary stuff. Brilliant. Because, and you have uh, this double coincidence, you know, because he's there for a job interview as opposed to, 
you know, a TV interview. He's called Guy. The other guy's called Guy. You know, it's just it's just a perfect storm. You know, you it's, it's the a movie. Yes, I am. Are you yeah. Guy? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we also have um, Liverpool. I mean, Costello was born in Liverpool, of course, but I think. Mean, Pulled this out because the B side is turning the town red, which was the theme tune to Scully, the Alan Bleasdale sort of half hour thing. Oh, yeah, um, which I was a big fan of. That's probably one of my favorite videos because it features a cameo from uh, Kenny Dalgleish. He, he, he appears as Kenny Dalgleish in, uh, in, in several episodes. Um, and then finally, the Teardrop Explodes final single, which is uh, You Disappear from View, the prophetic or, or just announcing the, uh, the end of them. But the way I found that these, these were my favourite band, as I said. The way I found out that they'd split up, though, was on Saturday morning kids' telly um, on the ITV, whatever the ITV competitor to Swap Shop was, presented by Tommy Boyd and Isla Sinclair. Now, in this, Isla Sinclair, who had permed her hair and was a bit more rock and roll than she was on the Generation Game by that stage, um, she had a little music news uh, section, sort of halfway through the programme, and I said, the big news is... The Chidrop Explodes, they have literally exploded. I just, <laughs> my favourite band had just split up. My brother was just laughing his, his face off uh, that my favourite band, and that was the way I heard it from uh, Ida Sinclair broke my heart over the Chidrop Explodes. Do you think your attachment to Liverpool was because you came from the West Country? Therefore, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't come from the West Country. Oh, did no, you not? Okay. You're, on you're the in line. the West Country I'm, now. I'm in the West Country no, I came from the deep south originally. I came from Sussex. Okay. So, well, same thing, right. I, I, same thing applies. I, Do you think that Liverpool I, was the home, home of everything edgy? Whereas the south edgy, sort of... Is... Totally. In, you know, in terms of politics as well, that shaped my politics. And I only knew of Liverpool existing as a football team as opposed to a place. And it, it seemed, you know, high unemployment Liverpool in the early 80s seemed exotic to me. And, you know, somewhere I wanted to go. Bizarre, just because I live 200 yards from the English Channel, where, you know, it might sound idyllic, but it was just where the land ran out, really. There was no see, it's it's so true. So I'm interesting. from Hampshire, so and I used to sit there and dream of being in Liverpool. That was a Beatles thing, obviously. But, you know, yeah, just think, yeah. and then everything that you wanted. It was, it was dark and edgy and difficult, and, you know, it was <laughs> fun. And it yeah, wasn't a load of people band, getting their lawnmowers made. Everyone's in a band in Liverpool, you know? And, yeah, uh, yeah it's... Uh, Yes, so uh, anyway, so going through my singles, so obviously these are 45s, and I'll come up with some 33 and a third 7 inches, which oh, are... Okay. And, and me. The, the, first, the first magazine giveaway was Smash It's of that 1980, was um, a flexi disc with XTC and the skids on. Um, these were proper vinyl on the, on the cover of, of uh, Enemy. Um, yeah, and yeah. you get four tracks by various people. We've got U2, The Smiths... Uh, we got on this Bronski beat and the Cocteau Twins. It's quite standard fare here, but you'd also get things like Mantronics or Trouble Funk, and these were really responsible for broadening my horizons beyond four white guys in great coats with guitars. Um, <laughs> these, these were just great, but even more so than that were the tapes you used to be at, the cassettes you used to be able to send off the enemy for I think, the, the figure three pounds forty-five sticks in my head. It's just the price of postage. And these were the compilations that usually Roy Carr and Neil... Roy, Roy Carr did them, Carr, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, they'd be trawling old back catalogues of various labels and putting stuff out. Um, C, C86 is obviously the famous one, the most lauded one, which was very much, you know, one note indie stuff. Um, but you wrote but a fantastic I, piece for Word about cassettes, didn't you? I mean, an oh, amazing piece. That, yeah. It's like the whole culture of making, of doing little home tapes for people. That know? was the last and, uh, time I went up in the loft for you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but the best one for me was the 1984 one, which was Department of Enjoyment, which was really Catholic and wide, wide ranging. And it was a masterpiece of putting a compilation together because in order for me to send off my £3.45, I wasn't, as a 14, 15-year-old, going to buy a cassette with all unknown names. So there would be a Smith's Live track on there. There would be a Lloyd Cole alternate tape, the Cocteau Twins B-side or something on there. But also, introduce me to, who's this guy, Dr. John? Who's this guy, Winter Marsalis? <laughs> He's quite um, good. <laughs> He's quite good. But it really, those, those really broadened my, my, my range. Um, they were very music. influential, those, uh, those cassettes, really Huge. influential. They were like the, were like the, the, long the, the sampler time. albums of the 70s for us, you know, for our generation. Well, amazing. Yeah. This, is, this is soul and tighten up and all those sort of things, you know. And 
and I think the compilation is 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 much maligned. You know, it, it parody, you know, ridiculed in in I'm Alan Partridge when he says, you know, what's your favourite Beatles album? Uh, the best of the Beatles. best of the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I think various fair answer. Right? Yeah. Various artist compilations, they have just a, an, a gateway to this massive, much wider world beyond what you had. And uh, on that note, um, if I say this compilation was, was uh, particularly influential on my taste, if I say it cost less than a pound, I wonder whether you can guess what it is. Oh, it's the one it's from Rough Trade. <laughs> it's the Rough Trade one? Not the Rough Trade one, but you are thinking it's the Cherry, cherry Red. One. Cherry Red? Cherry Red. That's it, yeah. Oh, Pillars of Brass, that's a great record. Yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant record. Brilliant cover. I love that cover. And so you get uh, 17 tracks for 99 pence. So anyone who's, whose budget extends no further than Paperboy's wages, like mine did at the time, <laughs> this is fantastic. And so this opened my eyes. Here we've got, we've got Tracy Thorne and Ben Watt solo, and they've just got together as everything but the girls. So there's a track of theirs on there. We've got the monochrome set. I went on and bought lots of monochrome set albums on the back brilliant. of it. Felt. I went and bought lots of felt albums on the back of it, so it works as a marketing tool. Um, but it's also got it's got a tiller the Scott broker. It's got Quentin Crisp on it. You know, this is yeah. this is this is proper eclecticism, um, and that really really shapes me in terms of uh, just getting out and, and and knowing, just having a much more wider taste and knowing what was out there. You know, and this is this is a year before Billy Bragg came in with pay no more than ninety nine three ninety nine. You know, more than 99 pence. What? That's one of the great right. selling points. Certainly, right. to people are limited. No, sure, 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 sure. sure. Your sure LPs cool. below 99 pence. Not many, are there? I mean, Gong's Camembert Electric. How much was that, Mark? Was that less than 99p? I don't know. I've yeah, got a cheese scented it, vinyl version of it. Somehow, which <laughs> might have been scratch and sniff. <laughs> Strong smell ah. of, of, of camembert, in fact. Well, not really. It's just impulsive. <laughs> I think it was something like 59 I love scratch and sniff. <laughs> I've got a Rachel Sweet compilation somewhere. Uh, where you, from, from, uh, from oh, from the smell of Akron. Uh, just no, smell it's the smell of Akron. smell of Akron. Yeah, and you I scratch it and you can smell sort of tire rubber. It's amazing. Yeah, that's it. It's the smell of Firestone. <laughs> it is, exactly. It's good. It's very good. Extraordinary. Yeah. to that okay oh your first review for word oh, am i right was that the well, first review yes. you read for us yeah it was, it was. yes so uh squiddy pussy white bread black beer it's a really really good album if you don't know it very good record very good record. but anyone watching the no fabulous album we're still waiting for the follow-up 14 years later yes but, um he put, he put out a single the other week didn't he oh that's right yes. I, yeah green yeah anyway yeah. so this is kind of symbolic this is even though HMV was obviously a national title, I was suddenly writing for national paid for prestigious titles called Word Magazine, you know. And so and from there, that's when, you know, I then start writing much more nationals for Guardian Sunday Times and, right, right. and whoever. So this is, this is kind of the thing that got me that unlocked that, that particular door. So I've always got a, a soft spot for that, definitely. Yeah. Which, and, and of course, all your writing led to your... Um renewing your acquaintance with football exactly what are your football books what's your most recent football book is that is the bottom corner is that the, oh, the most recent one is book sale the, 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 the transfer boot sale the one on the transfer window that's right yeah. yeah so that's the most recent one um bottom corner is the one that's proved most successful we seem to tap into you know there's, there's thirty eight thousand at the moment at least thirty eight thousand non-league and amateur football clubs so you know if you get one person who follows that team suddenly you're selling you know Best part of 40,000 books. I right. haven't sold 40,000 books, but it has proved, you know, it, it seems to have a long tail is what they call it. And it's, you know, it, it detailed the 2015-16 season. So even though it's four years old now, it's still selling, you know, as it, it's, it's got a level of sales, which is really encouraging. Didn't you tell me you're ghosting a football book? I have ghosted that. Yeah, I haven't got a book out this year in my name, but I spent a very stressful December and January, um, collaborating with the uh, former footballer and current pundit, Chris Sutton. So that was my first foray into, into ghostwriting. So that comes out, it's supposed to come out in May. It's coming out end of this month now. We probably uh, shouldn't you... ask why it was stressful. It just, I mean, it's just difficult <laughs> getting the story out of people, isn't it? Maybe no, don't answer that. <laughs> it, it was fine in that. It was just the deadline we were given by the publishers. Yeah. 
Um, he wanted an even tighter one, which we told him not to. Um, but also, Chris is very busy, man. Uh, he's, on, he's on TV and radio five or six days a week during the season. He has six children. He has six cats. He has six dogs. He has horses. And he lives miles away on you know, the top of Norfolk. So he's, he's a man who's either constantly on the road or, or on the radio, on air. So, but he's he very gracious and we fitted in lots of interview time. It's not his memoir. He's done his memoirs before, but this is, uh, this is a book on his opinions. It's 25 ways to, to fix football. Um, and so, and he's good. great and opinionated. Yeah. It's very funny. He's very dry, very laid back. And uh, yeah. yeah, we got it done. It hasn't been revised in the face of the current difficulties that particularly affect football. There was a lot of discussion of whether we would do that. Um, and they wanted to put it back a year. And in the end, it's, I'm glad we kind of fought it and said, no, it needs to come out this year. And um, unfortunately, football is back on the agenda. You know, if football was off for six, eight months, ten months, then it would look a bit weird. But everyone's kind of got getting back in the groove and certainly... You know, when the, whenever the next season starts, I think, you know, we'll be getting a bit more back to normal. So are you sitting there watching football with great enjoyment at the moment? Or are you like me, just uh, particularly in the light of last night's result, refusing to engage with it at all? Because it's not real because it hasn't got a crowd in there. I'm, I'm kind of, I've, I'm yet to make up my mind. I've not been, whoa, football's back. But I haven't been totally dismissive either. I quite like having this crowd noise which I didn't think I would like at all. And I thought it would be really hokum and there'd be a d big delay on it. So a goal would go in and then 10 seconds later something, yeah! But the people who are doing it seem to work well. And I certainly enjoy the ones with the crowd noise. We were talking about noise. this on another yeah. pod, actually. And, you know, we're the, talking the, to the, Theo the, about it. Yeah, yeah Theo. And it's, it's the detail in which they go in there and try and find the chance of those particular clubs. And those particular you know, clubs. And, and, and program them for the right moments. It's quite, it's quite ingenious, actually. Oh, my God, you miss it when it's not there. Have oh. you heard my, my idea for uh, doing something helpful in the midst of this crisis? All those out-of-work DJs who can't do clubbing <laughs> should be offering themselves to, to mix the sound at live football matches because it's, it's a thing that requires a great deal of art and, you know, yeah, close control and so forth. It would be a really interesting to, thing to try, wouldn't it? Yes. Because, no, I think you're right. as, you know, as Theo said, you tend to hear the chants that go, come on, Brentford rather than hear the opposing well, ones that go, fuck <laughs> off, Brentford. <laughs> fuck off, Brentford. Who are you? That'll be the next stage. I have <laughs> noticed that. When, when, a, when an away team scores and then it's really quiet and silent, and then, you know, everything is obviously geared towards the home team. But, uh, yeah. No, yeah. you know, I, I want to get back to... I want to go back and see football. I go and see a lot of non-league football during, during the, the season. You know, I'll just pop off and pay my five or six quid and... And, and, and feel it, you know, up close and personal. And, and that yeah. feels good, cup of tea, Kit Kat, you know, what can be better? So I'm missing, I'm missing it more live than, than possibly on the, on the TV. And the radio... Danny Kelly made a really good point the other day, that when you're watching a football match now, unless there's some supreme piece of skill, you've got no idea what level of football you're watching. You could be watching the second division. Because what you're used to is the size of the crowd noise to give yeah. you an idea of the, the status of the game. Well, that's that, that first, point, that first you just radio... Don't know. The first radio commentary that I listened to, they didn't have the crowd noise on, and it just felt like he could be just, you know, on a, imagine the talk station Western Division it's One, you know. Yeah. I, I happened to catch, uh, I happened to catch, I was listening to Liverpool and Everton um, while I was in the car, and then Mark Lawrence, <laughs> there's the summariser, and somebody said to the commentator, said to him, So, Mark, this is your first game post lockdown kind of thing, first time without the crowd. And he goes, do you know, I hadn't noticed. I thought, <laughs> you're like, this is a, a Merseyside derby. And you haven't noticed that it, it's like the reading room of the British Library. Come on. <laughs> what do you take us for? It's a very dry yeah. wit. <laughs> and he sat feet think... away from his main commentator as well. And he hadn't noticed yeah. that. Yeah, 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 quite. There's that as well. So uh, what's your next book? So next one, we've got, we got a couple of proposals out at the moment um which are doing the rounds so we, we, we're, we're gathering reactions to those shall we say um which is it's a right. difficult way to judge it's a difficult way to judge the way the book trade's going i mean bookshops are back open i think it's not been as bad as they presumed um but you know, there was caution before 
there seems to be even more caution now. So you've got to hit them with a real, you know, real absolute yeah. bullseye. You're, enter you're entertaining offers, Nigel. We can say I'm that. I'm, I'm available for work. <laughs> He's yeah. available for Aren't we all? We're all available for work. <laughs> Nigel, it's been, it's been lovely to you. A lot of you. fun. Thank Brilliant. you very how's much, the, guys. Cheers. How's the, how's the weather down in the West Country? Is it, uh, is it pouring as it normally is? Um, it, it's as dull as the backdrop behind me, really. Yes, you know, I could be kind of sat in the garden. It's, it's pretty great. I've been, I've been to the woods already with the dog, though, and that was, that was good. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. You know, I, I work from home, so lockdown has been largely the same. It's not a culture shock. I just have children, yeah. you know, fighting me for the biscuits. Control of the biscuit cupboard now. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> lovely, to talk, lovely to, to talk to you. Lovely. All the very Good best. Thanks, Nigel. We'll, Thanks, we'll see great. you back on the other side. Cheers. All right. Thanks. Bye.